Now, obviously, we, we talked about Masters of Reality. You, you've known Masters of Reality back since school. Yeah. I mean, we went to school in the late 80s. Yeah. They started, I read, they started like 81 or early yeah. 80s. How did you How did you know that? Uh, I met uh, Chris Goss from Masters of Reality through my friend Joe Cawley, who I was in a band with, uh, B Solution, that I mentioned earlier. I was in this band with guys who were a couple years older than me at Syracuse, uh, film students, and... Uh, they knew Masters of Reality, uh, who were a local band that would play the, the Lost Horizon. And they had been, um, I think the, the first part of Masters, or the first couple of years, um, they were two guys, two, three guys with a drum machine. They didn't have a drummer in the beginning. And Joe had become friends with Chris. And early on in B Solutions, or my time at B Solutions, he took me over to Chris's apartment to meet him. And uh, we hung out and listened to music. And uh, that's how I initially got to know them. I went to see them live maybe a month later at the Lost Horizon. And uh, they had a drummer. And they were amazing. They were, to me, like the best band I'd ever seen in my life. I couldn't believe that I was seeing this band uh, in a, a bar on Erie Boulevard with a pole coming up out of the <laughs> stage. Um, but I became instantly a gigantic fan. And it wasn't that long after that that uh, they got signed by Rick Rubin to... Um, the Deaf American at the time? Yeah. He, Rick Rubin had just, I think, dissolved his partnership uh, with Def Jam with um, Russell Simmons right. and was starting Deaf American. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty much a brand new thing. And he had signed Masters of Reality uh, based on the strength of a demo tape that they've recorded state and seeing him I guess in the city a couple times so when that happened I was excited and um, I pitched them on the idea of me painting their album cover because I just wanted to be involved I thought it was just so this is the coolest band I, I want to be a part of this so uh, so I pitched the idea and uh, mm, go for it so I did I painted the album cover um, that was a gatefold too wasn't it it was uh, I painted it during spring break when you're at college and it was cool. Yeah, it was very cool. Was it yeah. oil? <laughs> it was oil, yeah. Um, and so that kind of, that you know, that was the beginnings of, uh, well, not, you know, that was the beginning of my relationship with Masters and with Chris. Um, that record jacket went on to become, I guess, you know, closely associated with the band. And uh, it was a cool thing to have done. Yeah, it was very cool. Um, so... Um, before surgery, long before surgery ended, there was a period where I joined Masters of Reality, where I left surgery. Okay. I, it's funny, because I remember, I distinctly remember, and maybe I'm wrong, but I remember picking up a, a Billboard magazine, and I wanted to ask you about the whole Ginger Baker yeah. thing, because I, I thought it was, and I, I don't know, I don't know, I, you had another band surgery, but it was, you were there, and he was after you. Well, he was. Uh, I just couldn't make the time. And then I was going to make him. the timeline work. So, so here's, <laughs> I'll try to keep this fairly concise. So, I moved to New York City with surgery. Um, everybody discovers the joys of the Lower East Side and, and heroin, and uh, and I get a call from Chris Goss saying, "Masters have split up. We have been signed by Delicious Vinyl." Delicious Vinyl. The Tone Look. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's Tone Look and Young MC. These guys, the Duff, Dust Brothers, Mike Ross and Matt Dyke. Uh, two genius guys. Matt, I think, just died last month. Um, who had worked on oh, Price right. Boutique yeah. and uh, so. Beastie Boys and just genius uh, record makers. And they were huge fans of Masters of Reality. And they couldn't figure out why this band hadn't, you know, gone gigundo because they thought the record had a lot of hits on it. So they did the pretty uncommon move of buying out the contract and the record from Rick Rubin. And the band had split up somewhat acrimoniously while they were on tour, I think, with King's X, and split into two halves, Chris and Googe, the bass player in one half, and Tim and Vinny, the drummer and the guitarist, or guitarist and drummer in the other half. And Delicious signed both halves. One half got to keep the name, the other half came up with a new name. And the half of the name was Chris's half. Um, so Chris called me and said, hey, 
You've been signed by a delicious vinyl. Um, you want to come out and see what it's like playing drums and play some music. Um, and I said, yes, I do. So I got on a plane and flew out to L.A. And, uh, and it was awesome. Chris was living in Hollywood, and I lived with him and his amazing wife, Cynthia. And um, we became a cool little nuclear family, and we started playing music together, and it was good. We had a good chemistry. Um, first thing we did when I got off the plane was be in a Steven Seagal movie called March for Death. I meant to look that up, but were you yeah. guys were, were you guys in it as a band? Yeah, yeah. we're like the band playing in a bar. <laughs> gets shot it's, out. it's pretty cool. <laughs> I still get small checks. Um, Do you really? Yeah. It's perfect. Yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. Rockonomics just paid off. Yeah. <laughs> So, so I left. I left surgery to be in a band that I really loved um, uh, in Hollywood, and it was a hot band. You know, it was a cool band, um, signed to the coolest label. So uh, all of a sudden, I'd really elevated my situation, and I'd sort of escaped uh, a situation that I I was a little bit uh, wary of right. with the, the direction the band was going. So I was doing that for about, I guess, a year, year and a half. We spent a lot of time auditioning guitarists, every guitarist in L.A. Um, uh, some amazing, some less so, but there was a lot of time spent working up new material and trying to find the right guy to be the guitarist in the band. And doing some shows, um, but we went to a party in Beverly Hills at some manager's house, and Ginger Baker was there. And, you know, I was like, holy shit, it's Ginger Baker. This is the Notorious cool. Ginger Baker. Yeah. <laughs> I was there with um, Daniel Ray, who was a guitarist that we had settled on, who was a great guy, who had produced a couple of Ramones records and, uh, you know, really talented producer and guitarist. And we decided we'd walk over and say hello to Ginger Baker, you know. Like, hey, Ginger, we're masters of reality. And he looked at us and he said something like, Masters of reality, fuck off. Like, <laughs> wow, it really is Ginger Baker. Um, and, you know, we're sort of thrilled to get cussed out by Ginger Baker. Well, he uh, didn't disappoint. A couple, a couple days later, um, Ginger's manager calls and says, Ginger listened to your record and really likes it. He wants to, uh, he wants to, he wants to jam. I'm like, wow, oh my God, this is amazing. It's like Jimmy Page wants to jam. So we went down to SIR, and I helped Ginger set up his, his huge Ludwig drum set, and they jammed for a few hours, and it was good. You know, he's Ginger Baker. It was cool. Um, How did he treat you then after? He, tried, he always treated me fine. I mean, I only interacted with him uh, three times, once at that party, once at the jam, where he was very cool. Uh, I thought the jam was good, um, but I didn't feel threatened at the time, because I was like 22, and he was 52, and, and I was a young buck, and I felt... Very sure of my gig. Yeah. Um, and it was cool. And then I helped him break down the kit. And then everybody was on cloud nine because they had just jammed with one of the legends of rock. And, uh, and the chemistry was good between them. Um, then he invited us to his birthday party. And uh, I had a girlfriend at the time who was a little bit crazy. And the night before, we had been out all night uh, doing bad things. And the day of the party, I felt about as bad as I've ever felt physically on planet Earth. And my goal was to get to this party, which I figured would be full of, you know, Hollywood rock types. And I could just find some quiet corner, or maybe an unused bedroom, and just sleep for a couple of hours. This, this was my plan. So we get in the car and we drive out to the desert. And uh, out desert outside of LA, the, the houses become fewer and fewer. And then finally, we see a little house perched in the middle of two hills, and it turns out to be Ginger's house. And we get there. And there's Ginger and his wife and his son and us and Greg Bissonette. No way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we're figuring, I'm like, where's everybody? And Ginger's um, drinking red wine and I think he'd had a few and his mouth was all sort of red. And uh, he goes out to the barn and pulls out this cream drum set. <laughs> You know, like the Disraeli gears. I mean, it says Ginger and Baker on the bass room heads. And he sets it up on his patio, dusts like hay off of it, and sets it up on his patio and plays his birthday drum solo. And it's it's great, you know. It's, it's Ginger Baker, drum solo. It's good. Then his son, Kofi, who's a really good drummer, yeah. gets up and plays. And it's 
pretty damn amazing. And then Greg Bissonette gets up and proceeds to peel the bark off of every tree for five square miles with just like a solo of blinding technical proficiency <laughs> and intensity. It's just like, holy Jesus. And then okay, John. everybody turns around. Right? So it's my turn to play a drum solo. And uh, I have to get up behind Ginger's kit. And, and, uh, and I'm looking out over his flat toms at the band and Ginger and Greg Bissonette and Daniel leans over and says to me, how are you feeling? I remember I said, like, I'm going to die. And then I played my drum solo, and it was fine. I actually, I reached deep, and uh, I, thought I, I thought I handled it very well. Everybody so had nice things to say. I'm, I'm envisioning, this is a movie. I mean, each, each story you're telling me, it's like, there's, there's some good scenes. Yeah. So, so we leave eventually, and... Um, we were on tour with uh, Mission UK. Remember Mission yeah, UK? Yeah, totally. Oh, Wayne Hussey, Sisters of Mercy kind of thing. We played this gig with them in Ventura, and uh, we were opening, and I've always had trouble. I always did, anyway, have trouble with my kick drum moving around when I was playing it. So I used to nail it to the stage, or I put two, I drive two nails in mm -hmm. the stage in the front. And uh, we did this gig at a theater in Ventura, and then... They would come out with lots of smoke and caftans and sort of psychedelia, you know, and we had forgotten to take one of the uh, nails out, or somebody had taken the drum and not pulled all the nails out, so Wayne Hussey stepped on one of the nails from my kick drum and went through his foot Ugh. during the show. That was kind of a bright spot of that. But later, after that show, I came out of the shower and everybody was in the room, and they told me that Ginger wanted to join the band. So uh, I was stunned. I was just like, what? Okay. Yeah, that's I, so odd. I, well, I, I thought I, I could see um, I could see why they wanted to do it, um, and I had to respect that. But I didn't think it would work. You know, the, the style of music they were playing was very different from the left foot driven style of music that he had been doing, or style of drumming that he'd been doing. Um, but yeah, they they sent me back. They said, you know, he wants to join the band, and we feel like we can't not do this. Right. So I got it. I got on a plane and flew back to New York and moved in with my ex-girlfriend. I crashed at her place and um, was really bummed because you know, I went overnight from being in a hot band in L.A. to crashing on my ex-girlfriend's couch. Um, kind of starting over. But I did. I ended up rejoining surgery within, I don't know, a month or two. And then I got signed to Atlantic. And I stayed friends with uh, Chris from Masters. I mean, uh, we hooked back up again. Right. In 98, he called me. Um, after Sean died from surgery, I kind of got out of music for a minute. I just didn't really want to. Uh, I'd been a little bit burned by it um, personally and just sort of business, the business side of it, it kind of bumped me out. So it was that point that I bought a computer and learned how to use a computer how to make art using a computer. As a fine artist, I'd been really opposed to any computer aid. I thought it was cheating and all that jazz. Um, and I found that uh, the computer facilitated my decision-making process in a way that traditional work never could. You know, if you're an oil painter, you'll, you'll agonize over a change you make to a painting forever because it's hard to go back. Right. You can't really fuck it up. So you tape stuff up and you walk around for a couple of days and you smoke cigarettes and you think about it. But with a computer, you know, have to never have to commit. So you can try a thousand things and the more decisions that you make or more things you try, the better your decision-making acumen gets. And so I really got turned on by that. So I went, uh, I had to support myself post-surgery. So I, I learned to work with a computer and started being a freelance designer and then an animator and then a 3D guy and then a creative director. Um, but Chris Gass called me again in like 98, said, hey, you know, Masters have never toured Europe and there's a demand for us. Do you want to maybe go and tour Europe? And I said, sure, you know, because it, part of it for me is also about closing that circle. I felt right. bad about that. You know, I'd been kicked out. I'd never been kicked out of a band before. Um, so I wanted to just do it just to do it. Were you free to do so at the time or did you have to leave a job to do it? No, I never took a staff job okay. ever. Uh, I was always freelance. Um, at that point, I mean, I, I did end up taking a staff job. Um, I 
became a creative director at a shop called Spontaneous for like almost 10 years. Um, but I was in Masters Reality at that point already, and the contracts that I did with them, I had built in some leeway for right. me to go on tour. And, uh, and they were they accommodated that. So, so I went and did a tour with Chris um, and other guys that we got to play uh, bass and the other guitar. And it was great. It was super fun. The crowds were amazing. And we got a record deal, and Chris and I made uh, our first record together right after that. Um, and that's basically how we did it uh, up until pretty recently. We would uh, get together every year or two out in the desert and write and record a record. And this goes back to when you mentioned the desert. Um, you know, there's a bit of crossover because Chris also produced Caius' early stuff. Yeah. You know, that's Josh Homme and mm -hmm. um, what's his name, Nick Oliveri. Nick and, Oliveri, yeah. So you got, that was a whole, you guys kind of, you know, got it. they adopted you into that scene or the, into the... Well, or just the, kind, of the other, just... kind of the other way, adopted me or Masters. I mean, it, it was uh, when when Chris met Josh and Nick, they were in high school. Or it's just, it's happening. They, no one adopted anybody. That was the scene that was yeah, Masters there, there was, It's interesting. I mean, I don't... It, there's a whole definition of what the desert scene is. Um, and I guess there's some geographic um, commonalities between those bands, but... Caius or Sons of Caius, as they were called when I first met them, you know, they were they were in high school, and if anyone defined or or created a template for what the desert ended up sounding like, it was Chris, who um, found these guys, uh, recognized how awesome they were, uh, but maybe most importantly, knew how to treat their sound and not crap it up right. the way that producers of the day were doing left and right, mm -hmm. you know. Willing to let them be sort of woolly and low endy and uh, powerful in the way that you know maybe early Sabbath had been. Yeah. So um, yeah, that that Chris at the time was living in uh, Palm Springs or Palm Desert, um, and it wasn't until uh, some years later that he moved to Joshua Tree, which has kind of become more the epicenter of the desert sound. Right these days. Now is that studio at Rancho de Luna? Is that the studio that most everybody uh, records at? I mean, is that where uh, Queens and Queens don't? I mean, Queens have recorded there for sure. Uh, Rancho de la Luna is uh, run by a dear friend, Dave Catching. It was founded by Dave and a guy named Fred Drake um, in the eighties. Uh, they were in a band together called Earthlings. Uh, yeah. Amazing, great, great, great band. Earthlings um, also had uh, Pete Stahl singing, who uh, had been in Scream in Washington, D.C. with Dave Grohl and was in a band called Wool for a while on, I think, London Records that Surgery toured with. And he's an incredible, incredible singer. So that was Earthlings Studio, um, and it's an old house. You know, off the up a dirt road, right. off of the only highway through Joshua Tree, and uh, it's just an amazingly cool place, really kind of secluded and just a unique vibe. So, um, in the beginning, we didn't really record there. Masters didn't record there. Um, we recorded our first record that I did with Chris at a, a place called Monkey Studios, which was a studio that Chris co-owned in somewhere in Palm, Palm Springs. The second record we tracked uh, in a rented house um, outside of the Joshua Tree National Park. It was one of the first Pro Tools records. We tracked the drums at, uh, at a studio in Van Nuys, near, next to Sound City, I think. Um, but we recorded all the, all the guitars and vocals in this rented house. Um, it wasn't until later that we started to that we made a record at Rancho, the Deep in the Hole record, not the Deep in the Hole record. I'm sorry, the uh, Pine Crossed Over record. But in the meantime, Josh Homme started to make these desert session records, where he would just invite the musicians that he admired and have them come out for a couple of weeks, and they would make up songs and record them mm -hmm. at the Rancho. So Rancho started to get a reputation as a 
uh, a cool place to record and maybe more importantly a, a really cool vibe and so and as Josh's fame grew uh, more and more people knew about it and he started to take whatever side projects that he was doing that weren't that uh, there it would seem so he did I think he did a Arctic Monkeys record yeah. there and an Iggy Pop record there I think um, Foo Fighters featured it in there all right, the Sonic Highways thing. Yeah. Um, but it's not like, you know, going to Ardent Studios or Sound City. It's not a place with a big tape room or tons of gear. It's right. just a, a house that you can make music in and record it. But um, it's more about the place than the stuff okay. that's there. I think, I think I have a particular interest in it because I've seen a couple of artists around Charlotte have... I think I've worked there. So I feel like, I, and maybe it's the Sound City uh, um, or Sonic Highways. I feel like I've seen it. Like it is a house. You know, it's very cramped. It's not very yeah. cramped, but it's. Yeah, you know, it's not big. It's not, you know, <laughs> it's. Um, I just finished the logo for it like a week or two ago. It's, it's a house, yeah. you know, it's a ranch house. Really cool designed ranch house, mm -hmm. but it's not like there's 10 bedrooms. You know, there's. The biggest room has got the drum kit and the amps in it, and um, it's just a great hang, yeah. basically. Um, so, how would you describe? It seems like Masters Reality, like people are starting to catch catch on. You know, I mean, you're, now you're part of like, you know, since being, you know, rejoining. When was that? 1999, 1998. Yeah, I mean, you and Chris are pretty much the nucleus of the band. As it seems right now, I'm the only. Uh, I guess I'm the only consistent. consistent member besides him for the last 15 or so years. I mean, look, Masters of Reality is Chris. It, it right. always, you know, there is no Masters of Reality without him. And um, I have been, uh, you know, I've been eager to to participate and support that and and uh, add whatever musical dexterity I have to it. Um, but it's Chris, you know, right. it's his voice, it's his songwriting. And while I've collaborated on songwriting and, and uh, you know, played various things, it's, it's his baby. Um, but yeah, I've managed to be in it longer than anyone else has, for sure. Are there any plans? I mean, I... Were there reissues recently or in the last four or five years? I there, think there was I a... Something. Bongload Records put out a deluxe vinyl. Yeah, actually, a couple things happened. Bongload, um, which is a sort of boutique vinyl label out of Las Vegas, reissued the album Deep in the Hole on a nice vinyl reissue with colored vinyl, and I redesigned the cover, and um, that was cool. And Delicious Vinyl uh, re-released the first record uh, in a deluxe packaging, restored the original album artwork on the gatefold. It's, cool. it's pretty funny, when Delicious Vinyl bought the record and re-put it out, they did not use the cover that I had painted. They didn't? No, they, they put out this <laughs> shitty this <laughs> shitty cover that had a bunch of things sort of jigsawed together. It was a bummer. Um, and I guess people said, what the fuck? So they, when they put it out, they restored it the way that the original one was. Which is cool, so they reissued that, and uh, we did a couple little shows to promote that. Um, but as for plans right now, there's nothing. There's nothing on the on the stove right. that I'm aware of. Um, it's been, I guess, since yeah, 2013, maybe yeah, 2013 since we have played any shows. All right. So I wrap up every show with the same five questions that everybody gets. So let's let's go there. Let's do it. First question is, uh, what musical artifact? Would you take to your grave? Huh. Artifact, like an object? Yeah. What what material possession that you've come across over the years? Mm, it has, has to be small enough to fit in a grave. Bag. Huh? Well, the grave, I just added the grave part to give it the importance. <laughs> you know, I, I could say that drum kit did save my life, but I'd probably choose this... Uh, Martin guitar that my dad gave me. Did he play? He didn't. And in fact, my dad was largely disinterested in uh, in my 
music um, for most of my life. Uh, kind of dismissive of drums and my rock bands. And what parent, you know, I mean, if you were a parent of a kid in surgery, you might feel similarly <laughs> similarly disenchanted with it. But um, Everything about that name helps. Yeah, helps it was not name. a parent's <laughs> friend, that band. But... Uh, but he heard me playing guitar one day and uh, finger picking and doing stuff, and he came to the conclusion that, oh, well, maybe he is a musician. So for Christmas that year, he bought me a brand new Martin um, herringbone, you know, guitar, a beautiful classic Martin uh, HD28 guitar, which I was blown away by. It was the nicest thing he ever gave me. And uh, I that's a nice guitar. He must have, yeah, must have it's done a, his research. Yeah, yeah, it's a <laughs> fantastic guitar. It's one of the best. So I'd probably take that. Okay, that raises another question. This isn't part of the five, but did you ever get endorse, endorsements with uh, drums? Uh, yeah, yes and no. It's funny. At the time that I was uh, on Atlantic, I did not get a drum endorsement, but I got a cymbal endorsement from Sabian. Um, which was cool. I went to the factory and picked out cymbals. And Sabian was, was run uh, by a guy named Bill Zildjian. Did you know that? I did not. Sabian is Zildjian. <laughs> like, they they split down the middle. In was an it acrimonious a lawsuit. family it was rivalry? A family thing? rivalry. Well, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, so they split the, the Zildjian factories in half. And the formulas or whatever. And one side kept it. It was like a master's reality thing. And uh, Sabian is the first two letters from Bill Zildjian's kids' names. So, like, Sally, Billy, and Ann. And that's why it's called Sabian. Isn't that weird? Um, so I had a, a deal with Sabian. They were really good to me and gave me whatever I wanted. And um, It's funny. I got, a, I got interviewed by Modern Drummer once, and I'll try to keep this story short. Sorry. But uh, I was on the road with surgery, and uh, I was in Seattle playing a club called the uh, Off Ramp. It was called that because it was down the street from an off ramp, right? Um, went almost right over the club, and we had just played a show. And I was outside smoking with Greg Dooley from the Afghan Wigs, and a fight broke out, and um, between like a homeless guy and like a Seattle rocket, and it moved down till it was underneath the overpass, about fifty yards away. And there's a big crowd there watching it, so we walked over there, and as we got there, the homeless guy grabbed the kid by the head and bit his nose off. Ugh. Like clean off his head, which was shocking to everybody watching this, and uh, and that was the end of the fight. You know, that's a fight ender, and uh, the the guy who bit the nose off pew, escaped into the night, and the other guy, now the Skeletor like jet coming out of his face, you know, starts screaming, "Find my nose!" to everybody, and we're all freaked out enough to start doing it, and we look down and this overpass because it's because it's a highway overpass, underneath it is the kind of place that people would throw their garbage, you know, so there were little couches and boxes, and, and somebody had busted open a whole bag of these styrofoam packing peanuts, like hundreds of them, and they were all dirty, and it fucking looked like thousands of noses. <laughs> like, it was like, just like trying to find a nose in a nose stack. I couldn't believe it was happening, and I gave up after a minute. But then I looked down, and it was right in front of my foot. Uh, and I yelled over, dude, cut your nose. And they came over and, and put it in a Slurpee cup and, and off he went. No cops or ambulances showed up during the entire time. But I had become instantly like a minor celebrity. Like, oh, this guy found the nose. You know, went back into the bar and he shots and stuff. And Anyway, I do a phone interview with Modern Drummer the next day. And, uh, and I'm psyched because I grew up reading Modern Drummer and I've never been in a drum magazine. And, you know... And because this thing had happened the previous night, I told the guy that story. And then the article comes out like six months later. And by the time the article comes out, uh, Sean is dead. The band is broken up. Deal's gone. Everything has just gone to hell. And, uh, and my mom, my mom uh, goes out and buys 20 copies of this magazine to give to grandma and everybody. And, you know, the article is almost entirely, you know, for word for word, my grisly nose story. <laughs> It's like, oh, and he, he's good at drums. The end. You know? <laughs> so it's like, um, but, um, God, what was I talking about? Uh, yeah, Bill Zildjian called me to congratulate me on the article coming out. I was like, oh my God, I mean, I called from Bill Zildjian. And then I had to break it to him. Yeah, Sean died. The band's <laughs> over. 
Uh, it came out a long time. You know, the band ended three months before the article even came out. But thanks for calling. <laughs> it was a bummer. I felt bad. But yeah, so I had Promark sticks, Sabian cymbals, and um, then that was it. No drum companies gave me a deal, although we didn't really shop for one. But I kind of have one now um, with Sonar mm-hmm. uh, drums, who I hooked up with through Samantha Maloney, who uh, managed Masters for a minute. And she's a great drummer who uh, was in Hole, I think, and Motley Crue. Well, Tommy Lee was out, and she's a sonar endorser for a long time. Yeah. So she hooked me up with them, and they started giving me uh, kits to tour with. So if we went to Europe, instead of having to rent a kit for the tour, sonar would just give me a kit, which was awesome. That's very Because cool. those drums are amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the best made drums in the world. So that was cool. And I just I did a project with them last year, or out, of bl- out of the blue, Thomas Barth, their head of artist relations, asked me if I would do some design work for them. Oh, that's cool. For their SQ2 line, which is like their most expensive Maserati customizable drum line. And they wanted me to design a, a poster that showed all of the myriad of options available to the discerning chooser of drum components. So I did, and, you know, we, we traded. You know, I said, okay, I'll do it. Uh, just trade me drums. Right, so I got to design any drum kit I wanted and they shipped it to me on a shipping pallet and it's a drum set I would never in a million years buy I could never afford it you know um, but I got it it's amazing it's awesome yeah fucking A yeah um, these are right. longer answers than you it's want it's alright I was just saying, question number two <laughs> yeah this goes back to a, a, a small rock economics thing but if I were to give you a million dollars to give to a charity one charity who gets it Ooh, wow, charity. You know, I think uh, I would give that money to veterans, uh, servicemen and women. It's fair enough. That's where they cause. Yeah, it's amazing what uh, servicemen and women do. And uh, often it's just not recognized the way they should be. Very true. Um, all right, the, bring the house back up a bit. Number three is, uh, what would your walk-up music be to the Pearly Gates? That's really hard because it's it's defining yourself in the entirety of your fucking life with <laughs> one piece of music, which I don't think I could ever do. Um, hmm. If you want to pass, yeah. the next question is yeah, easy. I'm going to pass hard on that. All right. Question four, what is stuck on repeat in hell? Oh. <laughs> A song or like a playlist? Uh, Usually a song, but... I'll tell you what. There's one piece of music that drives me nuts, and it's a local commercial for Cars for Kids. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, you're the second one who said that. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That might be on repeat in hell. If, uh, for sure. There. Yeah. <laughs> okay, last question is uh, best concert that you've seen. Or Boy. just been privy to best live performances. Put it that way. You've been yeah, so many for different reasons. You know, um, well, that's really tough. What was your first show? What was your first concert that you kind of you wanted to go to? You sought out. And My first concert was Rush on the Moving Pictures tour. Um, that's you know, brilliant. My dad waited <laughs> in the parking lot. And, and that was amazing. Um, man, I can't, I can't pick the best concert I ever went to. I, I honestly can't. I mean, I have tons of concerts that were amazing, but is there one that was better than all the others? No. Um, you know, some of the concerts, some of the performances that, you know, stick out are the ones that maybe no one else would remember, or maybe they're just incredible for five or ten minutes. You know, sometimes you see a band and you know for a little period of time that you're seeing the best thing on planet Earth right right now. There's nothing better than this song, maybe. Maybe it's just a song, or maybe it's just the bridge of a song, but when it happens, you know it has happened. Um, And there's been a bunch of those. I mean, that's kind of the goal is to... Hope you get to experience that as much as possible. 
Um, and there's no feeling quite like doing it yourself or trying to do it yourself, trying to trying to transcend. Um, you know, I think music and musicians, or me, for me anyway, the goal of playing music is to try to leave, to try to leave the room, you know, to try to transcend, mm -hmm. to to literally lift off from the, the you know, the sort of tangible reality of what you're doing, you know, putting your fingers and hands on this thing and, and through interacting with other people and, and an audience even, um, elevate somehow right. that is not quantifiable mm -hmm. or understandable exactly, that sort of sublime. Um, so I, I wish I had a better answer for best concert uh, walk-up music, but I don't really. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Well, listen, after 29 years, it was great uh, it was Great <laughs> catching up. Yeah, man. I appreciate you doing this. All right. A big thanks to John Leamy. It was a pleasure reconnecting with John after many, many years. As implied, John and I went to Syracuse University together, and I can tell you firsthand what an amazing, fine artist he is, as well as musician. I'll post some of his artwork on social media this week prove my point so follow us on facebook instagram and twitter and as always subscribe and rate us on itunes we'll be back next tuesday with an all-new episode that should please any fish fans out there so please join us then that's it for episode 25 it's over go home good night cleveland